<clears throat> Hello, uh, we'll talk now. Uh, today is um, uh, July 16th, 2023. And we'll talk about uh, two architects. The first one is uh, Adalberto Libera, 1903-1963. He died at 60. And let's read a little bit about him, an extremely able and talented creative architect, more influenced by futurism than rationalism. Adalberto Libera was also politically astute. His activity as founder and secretary of, uh, secretary of MIAR, I don't know what this is, enabled him to establish a close working relationship with the high up officials of the fascist regime in Rome, where all the big decisions were taken about funding public construction programs and who were responsible for commissioning the hundreds of new public buildings required for Mussolini's modernization programs. So he was involved with the, you know, with the infamous uh, political uh, movement. Uh, thanks to these connections, he had a prolific career throughout the fascist regime and designed many notable buildings during the 1930s some of which are masterpieces of the international modern movement. One of the most important is his Palazzo dei Congressi, the Palace of Congress, uh, the EUR in Rome. This building shows Libera's great ability to design ambiguously in a spare metaphysical language that sits on a knife edge between modernism and neoclassicism. An interesting uh, pair here modernism and neoclassicism. His use of sail vaults in this building creates an innovative architectural space. He also designed Casa Malaparte for Curzio Malaparte uh, on the island of Capri in 1938, although there is continuing controversy as to whether Libera himself was the main designer. During the fascist period, all architects were legally forced to join the party, but the most successful went further and became important party members. Like his contemporaries Giuseppe Pagano and Giuseppe Terrani, Libera's good fortune in this period was due to his close party links. After the fall of the fascist regime and its defeat in World War II, Libera, along with everyone else, underwent a period of personal and professional crisis. But after living quietly for several years in his hometown of Trento, he recovered and began again to work on numerous projects, including public housing and office buildings in a new style that turned its back on fascistic modes of expression. Many of his greatest projects are from this post-war period. This was the man, Adalberto Libera. Il Palazzo delle Poste, the, uh, the Via Marmorata, Roma, con Mario de Renzi, the palace of the postal office. And it is a palace, but uh, modernistic. And uh, what can we say? It's rationalistic, but then it employs diagonals on the narrow elevations, which, uh, you know, stand for uh, formal rebellion, if we can say so. Adalberto Libera, at the conjunction between modernism and neoclassicism. Palazzo delle Poste, Le Pietre di Roma, and Alberto Libera. Momenti di architettura moderna. But are they moments or monuments? 
Palatine a Ostia Mare, 1932-1934. Interesting the connection between fascism and futurism. I think uh, there in the in the lab story between futurism and fascism is um, an interesting field for investigations, and I imagine there are already plenty of books on the subject. How come the futurists? Sympathize with fascism. Well, the future is love to war, starting with Filippo Marinetti. And look at these balconies, they are outgoing. There, there is a certain uh, emphasis on attacking. You see the balconies seem to grow towards the towards the top now. They seem to be, uh, or maybe it's just a perspectival uh, distortion. Scuola Elementare, Raffaello Sanzio, a Trento, 1931-1934. Diagonals again. I wonder what Rafael Sancio would have said about this building which bears his name. By the way, of Rafael, I just remember that Picasso said that he learned to paint like, a, like Rafael in four years, and it took him a lifetime to learn to paint like a child. Picasso, the worst dressed man in the world. I mean, usually painters dress well because they love colors and, uh, you know, they know about color. But Picasso, the greatest painter of modernity, was dressed so badly. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible, actually. He used to receive clothing, uh, you know, from famous designers and just throw them on him without any, without any concern for the color coordination or anything. Just, you know, just making a fool of himself with the way he was dressing, the great Pablo Picasso. Il Padiglione Italiano per l'Esposizione Mondiale di Chicago, 1933, again with Mario De Renzi. This is the model. Adalberto Libera, a sympathizant of the fascists, receiving commissions from them. It has some elan, elan vital, the building. And it's interesting that actually, you know, these um, architects who sympathized with, uh, with the fascists actually promoted a, a modern architecture or a modernistic architecture. And the fascists, the Italian fascists, loved it. As opposed to Hitler, in Germany, there was a different kind of architecture promoted. Il Palazzo del Littorio a Roma. Concorso, no pictures, il padiglione italiano, 
per l'esposizione mondiale di Bruxelles 1935. Look at it. Not the most modest building in the world. You are in construction. You look at the building and you look at that ladder there and you wonder. Now look at the car on the right side, the lower part of the picture, and look at the building. What do they have in common? The building is modernistic, but the car quite dramatic, no? And with those big letter X, mostra della rivoluzione fascista. Il Palazzo dei Congressi, 1938. Sorry about um, the resolution of these uh, images. A floor plan. Now there are exhibitions taking the place there. Uh, you know, it's, it's a generous uh, space at the entrance and atrium. And the, here is the building uh, seen from afar. Uh, clearly, you know, meant for uh, emphasizing the axis. And uh, there is a balcony here where was probably desired uh, to, for the Il Duce, for Mussolini to address the populace from the, from the balcony, the balcony of the Führer, the Italian Führer. So that's not quite a Führer. Here we see the atrium follow, uh, employed for an exhibition space for modern art. Ad Alberto Libera. And then light penetrating the interior in such a way that it made me think a little bit of the, of the mosque designed by Louis Kahn in Dhaka, in Bangladesh. Although in, in Kahn's case, it's, it's more uh, subtle and more complex. And then Baudelaire murmuring, Le nuage, le nuage, la balle, le merveilleux nuage, the, the clouds, the clouds, the beautiful clouds. Yes, they are beautiful. And then the balcony for the, for the, the leader to invite the populace towards what? He was a good architect, but um, you know the po political affiliations uh, are questionable. Now we arrive at this uh, very well-known work, Villa Malaparte in Capri. But as I read already, there are people who think that the designer wasn't just 
Adalberto Libera, but also the client, um, Mr. Malaparte, who crafted his name uh, dialectically or, uh, you know, confrontationally on the name of Bonaparte. So not Bon Aparte, but Mal Aparte. And here is the building with those stairs going to towards the absolute, towards the infinite. Maybe towards God himself. A spectacular setting indeed. Villa Malaparte, which appeared also in the movies, or at least in a movie that I, I saw with Brigitte Bardot. I hope to have some images here of that film by Jean-Luc Godard. Now these stairs might uh, puzzle the, the functionalist because they don't lead to a specified, uh, you know, measurable destination. They are almost steps towards the sky. No parapets to the stairs. So again, the functional functionalist might have uh, felt uh, uneasy. And indeed, you cannot use parapets on the sides of a stair, which leads you towards the sky or towards the infinite or towards the absolute or towards God himself. Some views from the interior, very spectacular. You know, they are almost like giant artworks, these windows. And then you see the dramatic landscape. In 1980, American architect John Haydock describes Adalberto Libera's villa designed for Curcio Malaparte as a house of rituals and rites, of mysteries, an ancient play unravel unraveling under Italian light. Libera's Malaparte house is private. It is a house of paradoxes. It is an object which consumes. It is filled with unrequited histories. It is a relic left upon the pinnacle after the seas have subsided. It is a sarcophagus of soft cries. It whispers of inevitable fates. That's what uh, John Haydock wrote. Casa Malaparte, the house that all fashion brands want. And here it is. Malaparte plus fashion equals success. And if 
the sunset or the sunrise pop up too, all for the better. It's really like an artwork hanging on the wall with a thick white frame. Le palazzine A e I, I, I in via Pesina, Cagliari, no pictures, unità d'abitazione orizzontale al quartiere Tuscolano di Roma, 1950-1954. We read it for after a few years of being, uh, you know, absent, so to speak. He came back and he built some interesting things, but no picture. Another pavilion. This one the, we have, uh, I hope, yeah, <clears throat> we have some some pictures um, also in Cagliari, 1953, a pavilion. Adalberto Libera. Il cinema, I don't know how to read it in Italian. I'll try in English, around, but it's not in English. In Rome, 1955. Quite an interesting cinema. But cinemas today are almost irrelevant. In fact, Michelangelo Antonioni, the great Italian film director, said that our private screens become larger and larger in our own homes. And then the screens of the public cinemas become smaller and smaller. An interesting phenomenon. Quite a remarkable interior, womb-like. It could have been a cathedral. The cathedral of the moving image. La Cattedrale di Cristo Re de la Spezia, 1955, 1956, 1969. I don't know what to think about this building. This, um, if that cross was not there, I don't think too many people would have thought it's a cathedral. Ad Alberto Libera.
surround cathedral. It almost looks like a sports arena. They could have, and I know I'm cynical now, wrestling uh, matches inside. Or a boxing event inside the cathedral, surrounded by chair, chairs with applauding people. Il Palazzo della Regione Autonoma Trentino Alto Adige, a Trento. Kind of interesting, you know, floating like this. When was it built? Doesn't say, but maybe in the 50s, early 60s. Some echoes from his uh, pro fascist uh, architecture, you know, this balcony here. At that time, the Duce, Il Duce was gone. But there are interesting things here, like what we look at right now, inside the building. Okay, so we'll go now for a short discussion and then we'll see.